Welcome to Trinity Radio. As I turn down my speaker just a bit, I am Braxton Hunter. Along with me is Jonathan, Jonathan Pritchett and and the the Mr. Miyagi to the Karate Kid that is Jonathan <laughs> That's Pritchett. Right. That's right. This is Dr. Clay Jones. We are so pumped to have you on the show, Dr. Jones. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm honored to be with you both. You're welcome to call me Clay, by the way. I just... Same. I'll call you Clay. Hey, lady, you call thing. him Dr. Jones. Hey, lady, you call him Dr. Dad Jones. That's, the thing that's is, right. I was <laughs> such a huge Jones. Indiana Jones fan growing up that I think it's kind of cool just to say I had Dr. Jones on my show today. That's right. There you so, uh, but we are so glad that you're here. And if you're in the chat, um, feel free to, um, if you, I, I didn't ask Dr. Jones about this, but being the apologist that he is, I'm sure he's not, he won't have a problem if we take a few questions at some point. So you can feel free to do that. We'll catch those, but, but try to put question real big if we get to that section we'll see those um and according to dr pritchett's rules i don't know if you learned this at biola or somewhere else but uh super chats are privileged yeah Is that no right? i learned that from my charismatic background. Your charismatic background. <laughs> all right so dr jones thank you for being here and so glad to have you on the show so um why don't you just share your heart or uh, a little bit of your background and some stuff so we can feel like we got to know you a little bit here okay. if we've never seen you before well, growing up, my father was an atheist and my mother was an astrologer and together we attended the United Methodist Church. Uh, wow. And now, my dad would say, if you pushed him, he'd say, oh, I'm, an, I'm really an agnostic, but he was a hard drinking, womanizing gambler mm. that I didn't see for the first few years of my life. Um, when I say my mother was an astrologer, I mean, I don't mean she read her the thing in the newspaper. I mean, she had charts and graphs and, you know, your moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter's aligned with Mars and, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> wow. Uh, Do you know uh, what that's from? No. The what's age of Aquarius. Okay. That's right. Very dimensions. good. Thank yeah. you. You know, I don't know if people are going to recognize it, but I mean, obviously I got that from that song, but that was the kind of thing she would say. Oh yeah. Uh, that's like that 60s yeah. song, that age of Aquarius. Yeah. yeah okay. Do Dr. Right. Jones. That's, that just, is it. Yeah. yeah. We're just old. He's not as old as we are. Slightly there you less go. old. There you go. <laughs> less old. I like that. You're less, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'm less young. I prefer that. <laughs> anyway. I just say I'm old. But, I'm so, old. I'm my old. dad became a Christian when I was 11. And the change was just, I mean, it was what it's supposed to be. It was night and day. Uh, no longer womanizing. No longer just out drinking nonstop. No longer gambling away. He was a superintendent of a couple of school districts, and uh, but <clears throat> so anyway, and and I just you know I became a Christian, and for me, and this is one of the things I like to emphasize to people. I when I became a Christian at at 
almost 13, two days before my 13th birthday is a Billy Graham crusade. But anyway, but when I became a Christian, I was, by the time I was a a punk of a kid, uh, porn loving, shoplifting punk of a kid with a terrible GPA. And so when I became a Christian, to me, Christianity was the pearl of great price. It was the treasure in the field. I felt like there's nothing else and I'm Mm. all in. And so uh, I start. I learned. To, I'm a, such a lousy student. I learned to read uh, in the eighth grade on using the Good News for Modern Man uh, mm-hmm. Bible, and and I would literally spend about three hours a day every day during the summer reading the Bible. And anyway, so and uh, so here we are. That's so cool! Wow, I love those great backstories. I know Norman Geisler. I got to meet Norman Geisler on one occasion. He spoke for our commencement here at Trinity, and he uh, and he he he. Uh, talked about uh, how he had a, a testimony of being a, a bus kid. You know, he was on, a, there was a bus route and he got on the bus one day and he thought all of this, whatever you think has happened through Norman Geisler's ministry has happened in part because some bus worker who probably never heard of apologetics Hopefully. was willing to do that, you know? Um, but all right, so let's get into this. Uh, you are, I think what a lot of people know you for is the problem of evil, right? Is that your best known thing? Is that? Oh yes, absolutely. In fact, my book, uh, over here, why does God allow evil? And then the book on the other side, um, so it's got a book on evil. And then on the other side, my book, Immortal, how the fear of death drives us and what we can do about it. Uh, I'm actually intend, God willing, one of these days to write a book on suffering. So I was going on a radio program. The guy says, what do you study? I said, evil, death and suffering. <laughs> and he says, well, that, <laughs> he says, well, that must be a bummer. I said, no, it's exhilarating. <laughs> Yeah. And I thought, he says, well, like, how could that be? So I started thinking, I need an analogy. And what I did is I started interviewing Navy SEALs. Mm. And I will incorporate them, God willing, into my next book, The Navy SEALs. And uh, because I thought, well, these guys know they're going to be tortured. I mean, they literally call yeah. it torture. And I thought, yet yeah, they do it anyway. And those uh, guys so, are, th- those guys, I've seen some of that on television. Like they do the hell is, aren't they the ones that do hell week and, and things like that? Well, yes. And they lock, yeah. they do the thing that they call them surf tortures where they lock elbows and they all lie down in a row in the surf and the surf pounds over the top of their faces and over their bodies. And, and the, the, the instructor will say, uh, we're going, you're going to lie here until three of you drop. Mm, and wow. I mean, it's, it's, but they do it anyway. They know this. I mean, see, you'd have to be a pretty <laughs> stupid person if you didn't know what you were going to get into when you decided to join the SEALs. But my point is, is that they go through all this suffering and, and actually now this, how this relates to the problem of evil is, uh, it, it, there's two things in interviewing these SEALs that I found. One, they had a terrible fear of failure and two, they kept their eyes on the prize. And that to me is the whole Christian life. Uh, mm. I, you, we've got to keep our eyes on heaven. We're commanded to, in first Peter one 13 to set our hope fully on the grace to be given us when Jesus Christ is revealed. And obviously we sure don't, you know, we don't want to be judged and, and, and condemned either. So, uh, it, it, keeping your eye on the big picture is what stabilizes you as a Christian. Well, and actually that keeping, seems, yeah, that seems to be like the next thing for you anyway is suffering because, uh, our, our Trinity students are are familiar with your "Why Does God Allow Evil" uh, book because they read it in the pro- our problem. It's one of our assigned texts, so oh. um, there's a combo mill in my future that you're going to buy for the royalties. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but an In and Out know, Burger. But I don't know how much you discuss this publicly, but I do recall in our lectures you have, in your own personal life, experienced. Uh, oh yes. A, a, a pretty well, intense I, suffering of yourself so yeah and your family and so and i remember t- talking about that and i know that a lot of people think about the philosophical problem of evil and 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 that occupies some of their intellectual life but i found that the problem of suffering and how to how to handle that even within the church seems to be what people deal with most, you know, yeah. you d- you die once, but suffering seems to seem we encounter it so much that that seems to be a lot of people's right. issue more so right. than the idea of evil. It's their own suffering. So if you yeah, can talk and we about yeah. well, our lives, my wife and I's lives have not been easy uh, to say the least. Uh, yeah. We one, we weren't able to have children, and mm. well, if anybody has gone through that, you know, my wife had several miscarriages. 
Uh, so we took in, we took in foster children. We had the police at our house seven times in two and a half years, uh, because we thought we could take in, you know, we were stable married couple. We'd take in the worst of the worst and wow, did we have a wow. Uh, but then, you know, I mean, and, uh, my wife has got, um, she's got a genetic thing. Uh, she actually, it's called, um, hypermobility joint syndrome, which means that she's very, very limber which was great in high school uh, and in dance and in things like that. It, but what it means now is that her joints, come, her joints, or, or her, her bones come out of joint pretty easily. Mm. And that's a problem. And, uh, and then of course I've had bone cancer and I write about that at length. In oh, my wow. book. Yeah. And so, you know, I lost part of my spine to bone cancer mm. and uh, I was in for the year and a half before they finally correctly diagnosed it. I was in increasing pain to the point where I could not, I couldn't lie. I couldn't sleep upstairs with my wife anymore, which made me very sad because I needed literally to get up every hour and walk around. Uh, to how do you walk function with pain. part of your spine gone? That that how does that even work? I mean, is it now at this point a major problem for mobility? No, in your life? no, not at all. Uh, I lost my tailbone, the bone above that, and half the bone above that to bone cancer. And frankly, you just don't need those bones very much. And uh, so, uh, yeah, if it was higher up, uh, that would have been bad. And thankfully, the Lord got me to a teaching hospital with one of the best surgeons in the world on the subject. He's the, the director of the musculoskeletal tumor program at Cedar sinai But anyway, wow. so the Lord has taken care of me. And, and uh, but that was, you know, that was valuable for me as a Christian. I am much closer to the Lord after cancer than I was before. And by the way, lying there in the hospital, uh, even though my the only person there most of the time was my wife, I felt famous. And what I mean is, is I thought, because I told God, when I found out, when I was first diagnosed that I had bone cancer, Jeannie and I met in the hallway and with tears streaming down our faces, I led us into a prayer of thanksgiving to God. And I knew at that moment that I'd conquered Satan in the heavenly realm. Amen. Uh, oh, that I had yeah. that I had put him to shame. Then they misdiagnosed the biopsy and said that I had a the, a deadly bone cancer. They misdiagnosed the biopsy, and the, my my surgeon said, "Well, if that's what you have. We're not going to take it out. We'll start you on chemo. If chemo shrinks the tumor, uh, then you know we might we might take it out." But but you know I'm realizing. And in fact, it was misdiagnosis having the same cancer that took Ravi Zacharias's life. Mm -hmm. Uh, but my wife and I held hands again, and we met in the hallway and held hands again. And I led us in a prayer of thanksgiving to God. And at that moment, I knew that I defeated Satan in the heavenly realms, that that suffering was not going to cause me. Uh, there was no amount of suffering that was going to cause me to deny Jesus. There was no amount of suffering Amen. that was going to keep me from honoring God. Nothing. And uh, I'm lying in there in the hospital bed, and I'm catheterized, and I don't know yet which kind of they they oh the my surgeon looked at the slides himself and decided that the, they they misdiagnosed the biopsy or they might have he wasn't sure so they but anyway they took it out I'm waiting there I'm catheterized and they pull the catheter out and they said now we're going to see if you can I'm going to be blunt here if you can pee and. Uh, and because you might not be able to, you might be catheterized for life. And I'm just lying there going, oh, my gosh, this is. But you know what I said? I said, Lord, thank you. I I thank you. I will take whatever comes from your hand. I am your servant. Wow. And at that moment, yeah. I felt famous because I knew the God, the Lord saw me. Yeah. Uh, wow. And I knew that angels saw me. And at that moment, Man. I felt famous. That well, is a, awesome. Yeah, play. And, and you're a church man, what, a local church guy. So. Yeah. What do you in in just spitballing here? What in your mind uh, does the church do right, and what does it do wrong in its approach to suffering, uh, in order to prepare believers to have that kind of attitude when when they encounter yeah. it? That's a really well, good question. I'd like to know the yeah. answer to that too. And then after that, let's jump into your theodicy, how you approach this uh, in That's in fun. a more uh, technical yeah. way. But I sure. love this. Because I feel like I've just been preached to. So, yeah, uh, that's a good question that Pritchett asked. Well, that is a great. Thank you, honestly, Jonathan, for even asking that question, because that's I think that's so important. The number one lack in the Christian church today is any kind of robust teaching on eternity and heaven and what we have to look forward to. Satan has done what I call extreme makeover metaphysical edition, where he's made heaven <laughs> look like a place you don't want to go. 
uh, that you're going to be sitting on clouds, sporting flightless wings, strumming harps and singing nonstop. None of those things are true. They're all Baptist false. hymnal. You'll have the Baptist hymnal. <laughs> yeah, have the, that's right. That's right. Well, we'll be singing old hymns. Yeah. Uh, and uh, none of those things are true. In fact, I just put out a blog recently uh, with a rather kind of a, well, iffy title, challenging title of some entitled The Lord Made Orgasms Possible. Uh, and my my and I and my first line is, is you probably said I think that I wrote that to shock you and I did to shock you out of your stupor that heaven is going to be a place you don't want to go. Uh, yeah. but, and, and my point of course, isn't that there's going to be orgasms in heaven. My point is, is that the Lord is a creator of food and drink and sex. And if there's not something that we enjoy here, uh, that we won't have there, expect better things in this place. So anyway, when the last time I just ask, if I ask your, if you're at your audience, when's the last time you've heard a set, a, a sermon on heaven, mm. it just doesn't yeah, occur. I and, and it just doesn't occur. No, I, I, it's, I it all, can't it's just the last. eternal life doesn't. I mean, it, it just doesn't occur. I'll tell and you so what, this, result, this, this clay, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I read uh, years ago, Randy Alcorn's book on heaven, which has been a favorite of a lot of people. And I think he admits that like a lot of that is speculation, but, but it did, but he brought out this point that you're talking about now that we don't think enough. We think about this world. We might even think about hell, but we don't think about heaven enough. And when I was in evangelistic ministry, old school, preaching Sunday through Wednesday night at churches, and wow. uh, I developed a sermon because I was studying near-death experiences and things like that. And I developed a sermon on heaven that incorporated some of that. And I found that to my surprise, that message, it was like what you 2 says about where the streets have no name. If nothing else is taken off, if you do that one, it'll take off. And I realized heaven is powerful, powerful content. Yeah, right. For the believer. In fact, you know, I did a I did a back to the Bible radio interview, and uh, uh, he said Nat Crawford said that it, their favorite the their the favorite fan favorite interview that's ever been done on their on their station happened to be when I came on and talked about heaven. So, mm -hmm. and uh, I, because I think that it, it, it people are desperate to have a view of heaven where they go, you know, that might be a place I'd like to go because you can't want to go to heaven. If it's, if you, all you have to recommend it is it's better than the other place. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. So, uh, Clay, you've asked me to call you Clay, by the way, uh, deflate is here. Another well-known YouTuber who is a friend of the channel says everyone hmm. should get a copy of Clay's book. Uh, why does God allow evil? It's fantastic. Yeah. Come to Trinity and you have to read it. I don't know if, Lesser apologetic programs assign his book in their problem view class. I know that our apologetics program assigns it in, his, in, in our problem view class. <laughs> All right. So, Clay, so that you don't have to respond to that, let me just say this. Um, so as we approach this issue, I, I, I don't think it'll be I don't I'd be surprised if it wasn't the case that uh, libertarian freedom functions in your approach to theodicy. But I'm just going to kind of hand it over to you to uh, if you want to, to I don't feel like you've got a lot of our audience is familiar with the basics of some of this uh, terrain, uh, but but don't feel like you've got to reproduce your book. But um, but what would you say uh, to an audience like this one about how we can respond to the problem of evil as it relates to humans specifically? We'll start there, I guess. OK, well, I, I mean, God wanted the Lord wanted to create creatures, created creatures with free will. Uh, we can't imagine creatures not having free will. I mean, yeah. uh, my toaster doesn't have free will. In fact, I think I threw out my toaster because we don't make toast anymore. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, my microwave doesn't have free will either. Uh, I, I mean, we want to be with creatures that have free will. The, these free creatures back now, this is pre-Adam and Eve uh, somewhere. And we, who knows, could have been hundreds of millions or billions of years ago. Some creatures rebelled, Satan rebelled. He got a lot of people, a lot of other creatures, not people, but he got a lot of other creatures to join him. Uh, I think then that the Lord created earth partially to respond to the heavenly problem of evil. So there has been a heavenly problem of evil. And what is it? Why did, why did Satan rebel? Why does anybody rebel? We're not getting our fair share. We should be getting more than we are. It's a problem of evil. Um, uh, God's not good. Uh, certainly. Uh, and and uh, I think so anyway. So Satan rebels. I think God probably I, I think scripturally it's supportable to say that God partially anyway created earth to answer the heavenly problem of evil. Because you'll notice in Revelation chapter 12, when Jesus died on the cross, 
then the accuser of the brethren was cast down before Jesus died on the cross. G.K. Beale in his comment, fabulous commentary on Revelation, it's 1,200 pages long, although he has a shortened version. But anyway, in his commentary on Revelation, he says, he says, until Jesus died on the cross, Satan had a point. And that's an amazing, that's an amazing thing. But Satan did have a point until Jesus died on the cross. And the point was, uh, nobody can keep your standards. Nobody mm -hmm. can. Everybody's a failure. And yet you're going to let some of these, these folks in when they can't keep your standards. See, Satan, I think that's true. I think Satan had a point. And it wasn't until Jesus died on the cross that Satan no longer had a point. Uh, and now the accuser of the brethren can't accuse the brethren because somebody just kept it, kept the, the law perfectly in every way and yeah, uh, proved great. even to his own right, his own torturous death on the cross. Uh, he honored God through it and it defeated Satan in the heavenly realms. And now, and by the way, it says at the end of <clears throat> the book of Romans is that God is going to crush Satan under your feet. In other words, we are also joining Jesus mm -hmm. in being the serpent crusher. And uh, <laughs> as you and I then honor good. God, as you and I then honor God through suffering, we participate in, be, in, in crushing Satan under our feet. Take a look at Romans, the end of Romans 16. And uh, so anyway, I, it's, so in a nutshell, I think that he, the Lord did an awful lot of what he's done here on planet Earth for the specific purpose of, of showing the goodness, the, how, the, how good he is. If, if Adam hadn't have sinned, then Jesus wouldn't have needed to die on the cross for our sins and we wouldn't have seen the amazing love of God. Mm. And yeah, so there are I, goods. I, 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 uh, you're kind of hitting on that notion that there are goods that only come about in a world that's right. where that's right. there is some level of suffering yeah. and, and pain or evil. Yeah, uh, and I want to make two quick points of that to all the budding apologists that watch our program. One, you can talk about Bible-y stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right? When, yeah. When, when, uh, when, when we're talking about the problem of evil, when unbelievers bring... It, you can it's an say, internal criticism. Yeah, you can say more than simply trying to have a philosophical answer to a philosophical problem. And I think that a lot of apologists who deal with this don't deal with it in this way where you actually give a Christian answer. Yeah, you're giving like a, it's consistent. And I don't right. mean to break your flow, uh, uh, Clay, but but I, I've, I mentioned this not too long ago that the importance of understanding what the rules are like with an internal criticism. When someone wants to challenge something God does in Scripture or something, they're assuming the trappings of Scripture, the doctrines mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. That's and it'd be kind of like the difference between if we wanted to criticize the fellowship of the ring uh, from the Lord of the Rings internally by saying, well, why didn't they just get on the big Eagles and fly all the way to Mordor? I know all the answers. Please don't spam me with the answers. But, um, but, but that's a, that's a fair question. Whereas, well, why are they going to Mordor anyway? It's fake. Yeah. You know, that, that is not, a, that's not taking into account the internal criticism. Yeah, the second comment yeah. was about the GK bill line about <clears throat> Satan having a point until, until the, the, uh, uh, the cross, which satisfies. That's, that was a cool point. Mercy. I like that. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes, though, uh, I can hear fundamentalists not even thinking that you could ever utter such a line. And so, so, you know, I think I think it, it does throw people at first, too. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but I think I, I'm agreeing with it. But I'm just saying that right. it, it's OK to point that out, because what it does is it illustrates that you it, it just points back to the gospel that only Jesus, the God man, could satisfy uh, you know, the payment yeah. for sin as a man and, and be the offended party as God. And that's the only way it could, it could be. That's just the logic of Christianity. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's not quite as shocking as people might have heard it. Right. I think that uh, I think God, the Lord, resolved to a large extent the heavenly problem of evil on earth with Jesus' death on the cross. And he's going to finish that up at the second coming. Of course. Yeah. And uh, I now that is a fast now. OK, I was hoping we'd get something mind blowing. And that is kind of mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, to, to the Christian audience, it should I think it could be. And, and that is the notion that it wasn't until the cross that the initial angelic problem of evil was actually resolved. That you don't think about well, they're the, the 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 angelic or the demonic complaint or the satanic yeah, complaint. Like they had a they had a thing, but it almost a point. <laughs> but but is it fair to say then that the cross is not just our answer for 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 the dilemma of being sin, but it it's almost as if it's it's 
God's answer to, you know, of course, everything. The, the, well, the powers and principalities that that, yeah. that that were disarmed at the cross. I mean, you go to Colossians for that. But it's almost as if you could read that as say, saying that the cross was necessary for God to own up the fact that there's evil. I mean, it, it, it accomplishes so much. Again, right. the love, the immense love of God to allow his son. I mean, we always have the, we always see this, you know, loincloth on Jesus for obvious reasons. He was not, there was no loincloth. He's hanging there naked. You're pooping and peeing. Uh, anybody that's crucified, you're doing this for hours. It's, it's humiliating. Uh, and, but this demonstrates the immense love of God for us. And like I say, it, his being willing to do this, um, thwarts Satan. And, uh, and I, I think that's, that's just amazing, uh, that now we, you know, I mean, and so again, in revelation 12 and the accuser of the brethren is cast down because he can't accuse anymore. It's been done. Yeah, it's, it's the, uh, it's the ultimate answer to the problem of evil because sometimes Christians can give greater good arguments that well there's evil because greater goods come out but we forget that that's the greatest good yeah that came you out know, of evil let me just say something you know atheists have given up uh of largely almost entirely given up the logical problem of evil yeah. where you're showing if there's a if a, there's a god is all good he desired to prevent evil if he's all powerful he'd be able to do what he desires but evil exists they've given that up uh because planting gun among others has shown uh, that you have what you'd have to do for the logical problem of evil to succeed is you'd have to show that for any given instance of evil that it would be logically impossible for God to have a sufficiently moral reason to uh, to allow it, and so they're they're done with that. So now it's just okay, but we see all this evil in the world and and what's going on here, and I think that all of this evil that we're experiencing in the world is uh, one. It's teaching us that sin is. It's teaching us the horror of rebellion against God. Uh, and when somebody comes to me and they go, well, you're giving the Christian perspective. Look, 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 look. And this is what Jonathan's bringing up. If you come to me and ask me why God allows evil, well, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and I'm going to give the Bible's answer to why God Amen. allows evil. I'm not going to talk about this. You know, I mean, uh, you know, th these concepts of a perfect, uh, you know, a, what's not not a perfect, layer, but anyway, the immu this perfect. No, being, I know what you mean. Like, where God becomes you know, more like this, this, this. Well, that's the problem, right? What do you what do right. you label that? Right? <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, I mean, the the greatest conceivable being. Look, right. I forget that. I'm not. I'm defending the what the God of the Bible. I'm not interested in defending what your some concept of God that's out there. I couldn't care less about that. You ask me why I why the God that I worship allows evil because that's the issue. I'm not interested. You know, in a atheist, as uh, John Feinberg points out, he says, "If atheists say, well, I don't like that God, I don't care because I'm not defending a God that you would worship because a God that you would worship doesn't exist." <laughs> <laughs> I'm defending Amen. the God of the Bible. Mm. So that's good. So, um, so yeah, so, so in looking at this, then back to the issue of logical versus evidential arguments from evil, the way I say it, let's see if you think this is fair. Um, I, I think that the, the logical argument from evil is making a stronger claim, but is a uh, claim, but is more easily responded to because all you have to have is a defeater. As you say, any possible explanation, even if we don't know it's the right one, that that could be true. Whereas with the evidential argument, yeah, it's uh, we've got to really dig in here and do some work because it's probabilistic. It's not saying necessarily in in that slam dunk deductive therefore uh, sort of sense. So, um, but do you answer those differently, uh, or do you, are you do you think that just presenting? I don't. The Christian I have never theological... had any. Well, when it comes to the logical problem, I, I haven't had anybody argue that with me for decades. Yeah. I think they realize it's been that's been put to bed by planting uh, and others. It's just that's been put to bed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the evidential problem of evil, uh, you know, I mean, my my sh short answer to why God allows all this evil is because he's he's allowing us to understand the horror of rebellion against him. Uh, mm -hmm. This is where it leads. Um, and is one of my lines is, you know, you're everyone's everyone is going to watch everyone they know die from murder, accident, or disease. And the only thing that will pre prevent that is their own death from murder, accident, or disease. And I always, when I'm telling an audience that, I always go, so have a nice day. But, <laughs> uh, but 
this is now, here's where I'm going with all of this. This is eternally valuable knowledge that understanding the horror of rebellion and seeing the horror of sin is eternally valuable knowledge because, as I said, I think we're going to have libertarian free will in heaven and not sin. And one of the reasons we're going to have not sin is because we are accumulating this eternally valuable knowledge and the judgment people go well what about those that didn't live very long or whatever uh the judgment is going to give us a lot more uh where we're we're really going to see what happened and by the way if there's about seven billion people on earth and there's about seven billion people that have been alive before now that's 14 billion people if each person's judgment lasted 10 minutes that's 266,000 years uh, now, I don't know how long the judgment's going to be. That's not the point. Uh, the, point is, <laughs> the point is, the point, the point is, is that the judgment's going to be a significant event and it's going to be quite an education. And I think that's another part of um, the reason that we're going to go sin's dumb. It's just, I did yeah. that sin thing. You know, when I was a young person, like I, I became a Christian, as I said, at 12, 13 years, well, almost 13. Uh, and when I'm early Christian, now this is the thinking of a 14 year old boy. I thought, so I can't have sex. Not that there were any girls lining up when I was 14, because there weren't, <laughs> but I thought, so I can't have sex. And this was my theology because man, I'd go to hell if I had sex. And I, I, I couldn't understand because sex just to me as a 14 year old, this looked like this has got to be a lot of fun. Why is God, why is God not doing this? I don't get it. Uh, I can tell you now having been, well, Jeannie and I just celebrated 50 years together. We started going out two months after I turned 15. Uh, but so we just celebrated 50 years of being together. Wow. Uh, but I can tell you now, after seeing how many people have been damaged by affairs and ad adultery and, and promiscuity, how it's damaged them. See, now it's not just that I see that the, the, the you know, I mean, the, the Bible says don't do it. Now I see he's a very good reason for saying don't do it. Right. And a so of, our, our culture is short sighted. Uh, there was a recent article that was talking about um, people postponing marriage and all of that. And because they were scared to get uh, married in their 20s. But it had said that couples who marry in their 20s who did not cohabitate prior to getting marriage have a right. significantly higher chance of remaining yeah. mar married as opposed to couples who do <clears throat> cohabitate. Well, I'd like to ask you a question about this because it's just a methodological uh, question because I teach one of our problem of evil courses here at Trinity. So I'm trying to learn here, uh, talking with you and take advantage of that. So you took a dog leg there that I didn't expect you to take. And that is, uh, so we're, we're trotting along and I'm making all the same moves you're making. And then you do this really interesting and I see the utility in it. You make this interesting move where I make a different move. What I would typically do at this juncture where we're talking about, you know, God, um, when we're talking about free will, we're talking about uh, God wanting to create beings that could love each other and love, love the Lord, your God, love your neighbors yourself. And uh, one could argue the highest expression of that is free love, freely given love and um, freely exchanged love. And that's how I typically go. Although a fair, I think a criticism of that is God eternally existing um, as the Trinity, uh, what you'd have to get into his free will and what all that is like. But it sounds like, well, it looks like from your facial expressions, you, you yeah, you would agree with that. Oh, I you do, go a sure. different way. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I just said I do agree with that, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, but you go a different way and you do this eternally value, uh, eternally valuable knowledge. And that not only gets you there too, but also gives you, leads you right into the free will and heaven thing. Uh, if it, Because I'm trying to understand the thing here because the judgment actually becomes the university for sin, basically <laughs> everything that's wrong with sin uh, about sin and how destructive and how it's destroyed people's life. Have I got that all correct? Did I characterize that right? Yeah. I, I think that uh, if we're going to have libertarian free will in heaven, uh, which obviously is my contention, we're going to have libertarian free will, significant libertarian free will in heaven. How is it going to be that we're not going to sin in heaven? Uh, and so I actually have a bunch of reasons. There will be no more, real quick, no more world. We're not going to be one click from porn in heaven. There's not going to be lots of little opportunities to sin. Uh, there will be no more devil. Uh, and uh, the devil's going to be in hell. Uh, we won't have a body like we have now. You know, I mean, it just wants things. Your body's not that discriminating. On Your body, I'm not talking about your mind, but your body isn't that discriminating. It doesn't care. 
necessarily where it gets its sexual release. Your mind may care, uh, but uh, we're not going to have a body like we do now. Uh, and then, of course, we're learning lessons here and we're learning lessons. We'll learn further ju lessons at the judgment about this. And I think also hell will be an eternal reminder to free creatures of the horror of rebellion. And so, in other words, I've got a number of reasons why. Uh, but but I think the biggest reason why all the evil and suffering that we're enduring in this world is going on, the biggest reason is because God is showing us the horror of rebellion against him. And so I like to use the, you know, I use the analogy all the time. I say, I say, would you, you know, Jonathan's probably seen this. I'll say, would you like to see me jab this pen into my eye? And I hold a pen. I could just jab it right in there. And uh, nobody, well, once in a while, there's been a wise guy. Yeah, go ahead. But that that's, <laughs> doesn't really happen. But anyway, yeah, I, I, I could probably about that. <laughs> I could jab a pen into my eye. I could, but I'm not going to. And the reason I'm not going to is I'm too smart for that. Yeah. Right. That that's kind of it. always been my answer when people talk about free will, but no sin. I've always told people, I think that it will definitely be logically possible that someone could sit yeah. in heaven. It's just never going to happen. So it's it's not... You know, it's not right. It's like now, but we don't give pens to babies, do we? Why not? Right. They jab it right in their eye. Uh, <laughs> J.P. Moreland, who's always more indelicate than I, I like saying that. Uh, J.P. Moreland uses the example. He says, how many of you, he's talking to an audience, how many of you want to get a spoon and let's go out into the lawn and, and, and chow down on a steaming pile of dog poop? Uh, nobody, no, no takers on that one for sure. But notice you don't let little crawly babies out next to dog poop. Why not? They crawl right into it. They don't know better. Yeah. And I'm, and so what, and by the way, I got the pen analogy from Dallas Willard, the philosopher at USC. <laughs> it's a good one. Uh, it is a good one. I like it. Anyway, uh, we're learning here that sin is stupid and that's an eternally valuable lesson. Yeah. We learn here, but I don't think we learn well enough obviously because we continue in it sometimes but but one of the things that that you've got me to think about is we could actually do a better job learning here but we don't know how much we're learning until we're on the other side of it because i think right. on the other side of this where you're talking about death and then judgment and then the presence of god glorified body all of that on the other side of that i think we're going to realize how much more that that we did learn through this than than yeah. we are learning as we go now and like i say uh, if you if you missed any lessons, the judgment could be a couple hundred thousand years long or longer. So if you missed any le any lessons, uh, I think that's going to make up for anything that you missed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and we're going to go that 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 was bad. And so yeah. I think that you know I mean there's more lessons to be learned here. So you don't need purgatory. I I like Jerry Walls uh, and he's a friend of mine, but. But uh, I don't think, you know, I came, I came at it a different, he, he actually says, I think purgatory has its place. I said, uh, what if there's a, you know, what if there's a half million year judgment? We probably are going to learn what we need to know during well, I mean, that that's time. A, but that's still, I mean, the, you know, in light of everlasting life, even a half a million years of judgments, yeah. that's uh, a... Yeah. Well, people, I think people sometimes when I say that, they go, wow, that would be a long time. And my reply is, do you have some place you're going to need to be? Right. <laughs> right. right. They're yeah. just thinking of standing in line at Disney World for 100,000 years. It's just long enough and, you're ready to move on now and never go back to that slop. And, That's what it and is. And not only that, but we're going to judge it. We're, we Christians, you and the, us, are going to judge the world. And the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3, we're going to judge the world and we're going to judge angels. Uh, so we're not just passive. We're not just viewing it. We're in the, we, we we're in the, partici we're participating in judging men and angels. So, um, we're not just going, Oh, wow. There goes another one. Yeah. Well, in addition to so, heaven, you don't hear that discussed a whole lot either. Uh, our, our role. No, in that. yeah, no. Well, yeah, you uh, don't people, people read that passage and they don't know what to do with it. I, I frankly do. And I talk about it in my book, why does God allow evil? But but uh, anyway, I think that we're going to judge the world and we're going to judge angels. And real quick, just since it's there, the reason for that is, is the creatures who have uh, seen the evidence, we, we believe the evidence for Christianity is sufficient to believe. Uh, my argument, I didn't make this up, I'm, this doesn't come from me, but God gives enough evidence of his existence and love and who he is to so that those who want to believe will have their beliefs justified, but not so much evidence that those who don't want to believe will be forced to feign loyalty. 
Yeah. And uh, so, uh, I, and I think that's, so as we Christians endure suffering and endure temptation and honor God through it, that puts us in a rightful place to judge those who saw the same evidence mm. and said, it's not enough. Because we're going to say, Good I saw, I looked at the same evidence you did, and guess what? It is enough. And your, deser your judgment is deserved. Well, okay, so... Um briefly if you want to i mean you don't have to be brief but i'm trying to be respectful of your time um animal suffering has become real big right now one of the internet's biggest atheist voices cosmic skeptic um alex o'connor has has is a vegan and has been out very very outspoken on this and animal treatment and uh that has created i think ripples obviously people have been talking about this for a while but um but it's become popular in these in, the, yeah, in sure. that realm so um how, how do we how do we make sense of of this sort of thing and like caterpillars that get wasp eggs laid in and they burrow out and it sounds like something Wes Craven came up with? What what do we do about all this? Well, you know, of course, that's what we call that's all falls into the category of what's known as gratuitous suffering uh, mm -hmm. or pointless suffering, and and mm -hmm. it's the same thing for children because you go, well, this is just a baby. Why has this baby got cancer? Uh, and there's several things that I have to say about that. First of all, the, all, all of this suffering to a certain extent came into the world because Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, then God cursed the ground. And when God cursed, what, what kind of pestilence, what kind of disease could not have a, come forth from God looking at planet earth and saying, I curse you. Uh, and so God curses the earth. Uh, and we know Romans 8, it talks about that the whole that the earth is, you know, all of creation is under bondage, wait, waiting for the glorious uh, re revelation of the sons of God. That, but, but when did it get under bondage? Well, when God cursed the earth. Um, and so that's where it started. But so then the question is, so, uh, so we're seeing death and destruction around us. And I'm going to use this phrase again, that's eternally valuable knowledge because it, this all started because of human sin human sinfulness. Mm. But the question I like to uh, push on skeptics regarding this is, uh, how would God do that? How would God keep all the animals in the world from suffering? Exactly. Now, what's the mechanism that he does that? Uh, does he put a force field over like a <laughs> somebody starts a fire? Uh, does he put a force field over all the video the, game, just, Clay? It's a video game. That's right. There it is. Well, uh, he, I mean, how does he how does he prevent that without making his presence too known? People say, you know, the same thing with children. How does God keep all children from being injured at all times? How does he accomplish that without making his presence unmistakably known? I mean, where everybody went, of course, there's a God. Children can't be hurt. Uh, but now that on that God. point, Clay, on that point, I know that my atheist audience is going to be like, Right. And I know you just said something about divine hiddenness a minute ago, but come on, man, if all if heaven and hell's on the line, especially if um, the traditional view of hell is correct, let him make his presence known. Yeah, well, you know, the trouble is, as C.S. Lewis says, that that completely obliterates free will. C.S. Lewis said it <clears throat> when he says he says the truth of Christianity cannot be like a multiplication table where we would have no no possible opportunity but to accept it. Uh, that the Lord simply doesn't want that because that isn't real freedom, that the, the Lord is actually interested in us having real freedom. Uh, and so, uh, he, like I say, he gives enough evidence so that those who want to believe will have their beliefs justified, but not so much that those who don't want to believe will be forced to think loyalty. We're not, you know, for instance, it, let's suppose that we got the Lord made the universe such that we could kind of look up through the ceiling. And we went, whoa, there's a giant flaming sword. And if anybody disobeyed God, he immediately cut them in half. How many people would call themselves Christians in such a world? All yeah, of them. Most of us, yeah. <laughs> How many people would be worshipers in that world? None of them. I don't right. think you get a worshiper in such a world. And that's and a fair so, point because Clay, I, you know, when I debated Matt Dillahunty, I, I, I looked up all his stuff and tried to see what his thinking was. And he would often say that if it, he became convinced that the God of the Bible was true, was real, he would believe intellectually in terms of mental ascent, but he would not worship this God. Yeah. Well, if that's the case, then the divine hiddenness thing rings hollow a bit, doesn't it? 
well, not I, no. Well, then the judgment comes for you. That's yeah. see, I'm getting more and more. Uh, you know, the judgment comes for you because you don't look. They don't like God. Mm-hmm. I don't believe anyone ever rejects Christianity when it's being properly presented. Uh, I don't believe that anyone ever rejects properly the properly presented gospel for purely intellectual reasons. I don't think that ever occurs. Uh, and now yeah. atheists are going, oh, no, I, you know, that's not true. I have great. In-. Well, at the judgment, that'll all be exposed and we're going to see. Uh, yep. Because frankly, I don't, I don't think they want to submit their lives to God, and and so they're just making up excuses. And I, I mean, like for instance, the hallucination theory. Well, I know this is off topic. You know, just just one more sentence about it. It's that Jesus, that the disciples had mass hallucinations of Jesus' resurrection. Basically, is ridiculous. But it's I don't want to believe that the universe mm-hmm. popped into existence out of nothing, uncaused. That's dumb. Um, that first life, you know, I mean, atheist Fred Hoyle was the one who came up with this, that, that life, that life, first life evolved by chance. He said it is equivalent to a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and assembly in a 747. That was said by an atheist physicist, Fred Hoyle. That wasn't said by Richard Dawkins, by the way, quotes that in his book, The God Delusion, and he agrees with Fred Hoyle. And so, so I like to point to these things and say, so the universe popped into existence out of nothing uncaused. Uh, first life assembled itself by complete accident. And all these people had hallucinations and you're going, oh, there's not enough evidence for Christianity. No, you are wicked and you don't want Christianity to be true. That's the real issue. We I, can see where you get it, Pritchett. Yeah, I, well, that's why <laughs> I say that. Yeah, and, and going back to the divine hiddenness thing, it's not like God... I mean, even when God does what people ask, okay, parts of sea, how how long before they're building a golden calf, right? Jesus performs <laughs> miracles. They still reject. It doesn't matter. I mean, you. So, like he said, I, I like that line about enough to know, but not so much to feign allegiance, because that that's really what you would get. But we saw we saw some of that happening within the biblical narrative too. You know, let me, I just wrote an article on that. It was, it's published in the latest edition of the Cre- uh, Christian Research Journal uh, entitled The Four Types of Divine Hiddenness. And the, the thing about, because people say, well, how could Israel, and I had a famous apologist, I won't mention his name, ask me that question, say, oh, I don't understand. Uh, God obviously showed his power much more than he did then, he did, uh, or then than he does now. Well, there was four, there's four major types of divine hiddenness. The first is, is there a God at all? Well, there, there wouldn't have been any, there wouldn't have been any, uh, there wouldn't have been any Egyptians or is, Israelites in that, in Egypt that didn't believe there was a God. That wasn't even a question. Uh, everybody believed there was a God. There's no evidence right. that there was any such thing as an atheist during that time. The second type though is, um, who is this God? And that is... That's why the Lord needed to have a continuity. So he has a continuity from uh, the, the miracles occurring in Egypt, but he needs to have the cl- pillar of cloud and fire taking them out so that no, they don't go, so that when he does miracles later, they don't go, this is a different God. Right. Because that's what mm-hmm. constantly happened in the Old Testament. So it's, is there a God? Which God is, is the true God? So he has to do that. But then is this God good? And that's, see, that's another type of divine hiddenness. And the Lord was constantly bringing them into places where there wasn't enough food. There wasn't necessarily drinkable water. Uh, they thought they were going to starve. Now, see, that's challenging them regarding whether this God is good. He leaves them. Moses leaves them for 40 days. They make a calf for crying out loud because they go, I, we don't know where this man Moses went. So we'll make our own God. And this is the God that delivered you out of uh, you yeah. know, e- Egypt. So uh, there's there's four four major types of divine hiddenness. And so, but in today, today the big issue is, uh, is there a God at all? And then of course, which God is a true God? Is Christianity true? But so, and problem of evil is, is God good or powerful? Yeah. Well, yeah. the free will but, defense, you know, uh, one of the pushbacks I always get, and of course you're, you're saying, does God create a cartoon world where he protects animals, protects nature and all of that kind of stuff or, or not, you know, explain how he does it. I've always told people that, well, the, actually the free will defense answers the, 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 the natural problem of evil as well, or the problem of evil in nature, because even if it's, I don't care what anyone believes about global warming, if you agree that it's logically possible 
at least, or you could say that it is very likely that our human behavior and actions contribute to damaging the environment, then you have no objection uh, to Agreed. human yeah. free will Absolutely. and behavior impacting nature. Yeah. Okay. So um, I want to do, uh, can we do some questions? Are you okay with doing some questions? Um, well, uh, that was a question. And so I'm that is a question. And I yes. have another question. So yes, there's So yes. <laughs> okay. First of all, Chris date is here and he gave us $5. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, love Chris. And, um, uh, he actually is one of the questioners. We're going to get to his, but first I want to know, I have a dog named Indiana. That's how big of a fan I am of the Indiana Jones franchise because he was named after the dog, Indiana. The so, dog, Indiana. uh, is Indiana going to be with me forever? I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't be surprised. I don't Good know. Good answer. I don't know. I'm asking the questions everybody wants. To I think have. it's possible. I think it's possible, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. And I think that, by the way, uh, I, I, I think it's possible that all the animals pre-fall talk. Uh, Lewis obviously uh, went that way that they all spoke. I think it's possible. Uh, take Balaam's donkey, by the way. Balaam's, you know, ba it doesn't say that the angel spoke through the donkey. It says he opened the donkey's mouth. Uh, and the donkey says, why have you been beating me these three times? Haven't I been a good donkey? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the best I, story. I like, I like the cognition, the level yeah. of cognition. I've been a good yeah. donkey. Why are you hitting me? Uh, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, I think that I, I wouldn't be surprised not only in heaven that the, you, some of the pets that we love will be there. I wouldn't be surprised if they actually talked. So yeah, now it'd, I'm speculating. It'd be like the reverse of how it is now where the atheists say, well, you guys believe in talking donkeys and snakes? And in the end, it'll be like, you guys don't believe in talking donkeys and snakes. <laughs> so, well, yeah, it could be. You never know. Could be. I, I'm a, I, I lean that way myself. Not, I don't know. Yeah. About, I've never thought about talking, but I do lean myself that they're there. I've, Balaam's donkey has been a better servant to the Lord than a lot of other people that, <laughs> yeah. that I know. <laughs> so, you know, if you yeah. want to Google something, Google Alex the Talking Parrot by by a professor professor worked with alex this parrot uh, uh her name's pepperberg it was written up in scientific america you can find a video of alex talking uh alex knew 1100 words could count to six could identify objects by shape color and texture and she'd give it different ch challenges and say how many blue blocks and there'd be there'd be blue triangles and blue other things uh, and then there'd be green and, and Alex could count them and tell her. So just saying, uh, let that bird run. For I'm glad there's not going to be resentment in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> if all those animals are going to be there because yeah, yeah. they've got a pretty good case. Yeah. They would have man. a good case. Yeah. That would be right. bad. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we've got some questions here. Uh, I don't know why that's there. All right. Here is one from, uh, I think this one came earlier. So Christoph Keating says, um, Hold on just a second here. Just as Adam presumably never had to learn not to crawl into dog poop or how to talk and walk, but was um, inbuilt with that knowledge, could he have been inbuilt with the knowledge of how bad sin is? I'm not sure that he didn't have to learn to not walk into dog poop. I don't know how much knowledge was built into him. Uh, but, you know, part of the, there's different kinds of answers to this, but part of the one was it, the, from the beginning of the ages, it was always expected that Adam was going to sin uh, because the Lord wanted to have Jesus come to die for the sins of the world, where the scripture says that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. It was slain before the foundation of the world, in God's mind. That this is a this is going to be accomplished. It's fait accompli. It's it's done, uh, and so the Lord wanted to give Adam free will, uh, and did give him free will, and uh, and and knew frankly he knew it was not. It didn't take. Oh wow, he sinned. Who knew? Uh, and notice there was also epistemic distance. We haven't actually used that phrase, but there was divine hiddenness going on in the garden. Uh, that the Lord was not sitting next to Adam and Eve or standing next to Adam and Eve when they decided to rebel. Where was he? He wasn't there. He was out doing something else. Uh, and so uh, I think that free will, again, this is about free will. The want, God wants to create creatures with free will. Uh, and we are now learning that, uh, indeed, Adam's sinful choice was really horrific. And, mm. in fact, it resulted in the death of every man, woman, and child. 
Yeah, I, I, I always say about the tree in the garden, it makes perfect sense on free will because there had to be something to freely sacrifice every day in service to your king. And, uh, and I, th I think it makes perfect sense there. If there's no tree, there was no, there's nothing to exercise your free will. I mean, you could on, on nominal things, but in a meaningful way like that, right. You know, um, Absolutely. all right. So thank you for that. And thank you for that super chat. All right. Chris date here says I didn't, don't fear hell now because of Christ's atoning work, uh, covers my sins. Won't that be true in heaven too? So I think he's referring there to the notion that, um, eternal conscious torment would serve as an ongoing reminder not to turn away from Yahweh in heaven. Uh, all I can say to that is, is that I, I don't, you know, I mean, for instance, uh, I know there are venomous snakes not far from where I live. Uh, and I definitely watch out for them, but I don't live in fear of them. I know they're there. I know there are things in my garage that could kill me dead uh, very quickly. It's kind of, that, but I don't say, <laughs> oh my gosh, there's things in my garage that could kill me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, so I don't, I don't, no, I don't, I don't think that knowing that something's going to happen when it's not going to be something that I'm going to do, but knowing that, but seeing the results of the horror of rebellion, uh, I think it's yeah, the just eternal a, reminder, a, not the eternal, you're not, you, you don't all of a sudden forget that Christ atoned for your sins in heaven. What you're saying is it's an eternal reminder of that education and the consequences. That's right. Uh, That's yeah. Right. So is it you an know, eternal warning or an eternal reminder? It's I, eternal guess, reminder, I think, right. I think it's an, I think it's an eternal reminder, not gotcha. an eternal, not an eternal warning. All. Yeah. I, 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 we're, we're being reminded of the horror of rebellion. Also, you know, there's this interesting thing. And I think that people, boy, one, one day I was studying Ephesians two and just lights went on and the light that went on was, that it says that Christians, that we Christians are going, are seated with Christ in the heavenly places and that in the coming ages, the Lord intends to use us as examples of his grace in the coming ages. See, whereas the non-Christians, those who reject Jesus may be an example of what happens when you do that, the Christian uh, is going to be an example of God's grace and God's wonder throughout the ages, through the coming ages. Read Ephesians 2. It's it's fascinating. So he's, I think the Lord is building things in there to say, see, Jesus in his in his post-resurrection body, his glorified body, still had the wounds. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that he, you know, I mean, he, the, that's another eternal reminder, right? Eternal yeah, reminder. That's a good point. We're going to yeah. be seated in the heavenly places. That's an eternal reminder. Hell mm -hmm. is going to be an eternal reminder. Uh, of of what's going on, and plus, I think we'll see. You know, I think if we wanted to, this is speculation. I don't I don't build a doctrine on it, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if we could go in like the rich man and Lazarus, and say, and even go in at, at C.S. Lewis's wonderful uh, work, The Great Divorce, and say, so why are you know what's going on? And hear their stupid excuses, and see their lies, and all the folly that they're they're telling on why they don't deserve where they are. You know. Uh, like I said, that's speculation. Don't build a doctrine on it. I don't know that it's well, true. Well, you can't not, talk about this stuff too much without some speculation. Yeah, and and I think the spec. I always say speculation's fine as long as you re as long as you label it speculation as you yeah. know and realize I'm not going to build a doctrine on it. Okay, Punchbowl Haircut, who is a favorite here at the channel, says we don't have favorites except for Punchbowl Haircut. Yeah, exactly. would a word with no, even anyone who super chats is a favorite. Would a world with even just mere apparent gratuitous suffering be more expected on naturalism than theism? So, for the audience, uh, sometimes if you want to try and see which thing seems more plausible, you say, okay, um, what would it's like an abductive thing? What would I expect to see if there is a God? What would I expect to see? if atheism and so like for example consciousness might be an evidential chip that falls in favor of theism we would not expect that on naturalism we would expect that on but theism. this much evil might be more expected but but that's the yeah, yeah that's the question i think here is doesn't the, it wouldn't this be an evidential chip let's say that falls in favor of naturalism well you know it's funny uh Again, if you believe in a robust libertarian free will, I don't think, I mean, you can see, I don't find it a problem with, with all the evil that's in the world. But let's take a couple of examples, though, uh, that I think is people, one of the favorite examples, and I've even heard some Christians go, we'll never be able to give a sufficient uh, response to uh, the Holocaust, that that's got to be gratuitous. And, uh, and I, one of the questions when people bring up, well, the Holocaust, I said, if there is no God, who's responsible for the Holocaust? Well, people are, 
okay, now if there is a God, uh, who's responsible for the Holocaust? It's still people. I mean, yeah. come on. Yeah. You know, Man, people, we read a people. brutal book in your course on that too. Just <laughs> normal, ordinary people going or, into or, Ordinary men. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I recommend ordinary men reserve police battalion 101 in the final solution in Poland. And and people mm. didn't have to, as Jonathan is bringing up. If you read that book, n nobody had to kill Jews. Nobody ever had to. If you said, I don't have the stomach for it, you could just walk right out. This is something mm. they wanted to do. And so when wow. people bring up these instances of this person doing this horrible thing or that person doing that horrible thing, I said, uh, the, the, what they're really asking is God should interfere with their freedom more than he does, because that's the only way that's the only, yeah. so he should stop them from, but what if he wants us to understand, for instance, when it comes to the Holocaust, I quote, uh, in my book, I quote George Quinn and historian, George Quinn and psychologist Leon Rapoport, who wrote a book on the Holocaust. And they, they start off saying, where can one find an affirmative meaning in life if human beings can do such things. He says, if one, if they say, if one stays at the Holocaust long enough, sooner or later, the ultimate truth begins to reveal itself. One knows finally that one might either do it or be done to. Uh, mm -hmm. And he says, it can happen anywhere. What caused, and, and by the way, I've got a lot of Holocaust books uh, or genocide books, not just Holocaust, genocide books around the house here and behind me. And one of the things about genocide is every genocide researcher I've ever read, there's not one exception. And every gen in, in fact, every genocide victim I've ever read agrees that it's the average member of a population that commits genocide. Oh, wow. And, and by the way, Jews don't think the Germans were worse people than they were. They do not. As, a, as the, those who study the Holocaust, they don't. You know why they don't? Because the Holocaust would never have occurred if so many Jews hadn't helped the Germans do it. The Germans didn't have enough manpower to staff the camps and to staff the ghettos, and they had to use Jews. Mm. And uh, there's this three volume, The Destruction of the European Jews that I read. And one of them, this one guy is reflecting, he says, what we needed to do when they had these Jews that were helping Germans in the ghetto, helping the Nazis in the ghetto, he says, what we needed to do, he said, they didn't have guns. What we needed to do is hang them from the lampposts in the middle of the night to send a message to other Jews going, this is what's going to happen to you. We needed to do that because the Germans couldn't even have done it. So that's why Jews that study genocide, they don't go, the Germans were really worse people than us. They don't think that because they know so many Jews helped. Wow. This is yeah. the knowledge of good and evil, by the way, right. that we're deeming on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So we got that. Uh, okay. Here's one. Uh, let's see miscellaneous thank you for the super chat says why did god allow lucifer and that alone is an interesting thing to talk about lucifer into the garden oh that is a good question i, I thought you were going to say why did he allow lucifer and that's just why did he allow free creatures uh yeah. and I, I i think the answer to why he allowed it because he wanted adam and eve to have a clear choice uh, between obeying God or not. And so he allowed a being to come in there and say, so what do you think? And I think, by the way, I think Satan was sent. I mean, I think Satan was partially exiled to planet earth because when you read in Job, it, it says, um, you know, where have you, the Lord says, where have you been? He says, oh, walking up and down the earth to and fro on it. In other words, that's where I, that's where I hang out. Uh, but, uh, have you I, ever read I, Lewis's I think, space trilogy? Yo, oh, yes, I love the space trilogy. That's what you're making me think of. We've yeah. gone with a silent planet. We've gone silent, you know, radio yeah. silent among the angels, basically. But the, the Lord wanted the temptation to occur for Adam and Eve. He wanted them to have that temptation and that choice. And so, you know, pe I think people are going, yeah, but we should have, again, we should have, God should have somehow circumvented this, which would have circumvented Jesus dying on the cross. We, if you're a Christian, we are actually, you and I Christians are actually in a better state today than we would have been if Adam and Eve had never eaten from the tree. We're, are, we're in better, we're, we're better off than we were if Adam and Eve had never ate from the tree because we've got to get to know God, the son, allow himself to be tortured to death to demonstrate his love for us. And so I think that's Yeah, but, and, and I've seen some of the questions in the chat throughout the discussion today, it's, uh, who were who were who were phrasing it like, well, even with libertarian free will, why did why did God create a world with evil in it? And I want to specify, I'm always careful to say God didn't create a world with evil in it. He created a world that he knew would have evil in it. Um, yes. 
but that's a whole different ball game from God created a world with yeah, evil. And he can purpose that evil. Now so, on maybe yeah. on a certain theodicy I can think of, maybe there's a, something a little more deterministic. In right. That, a, but. A, a, a huge <laughs> unsatisfying answer to the problem of evil from our reformed brethren, love them to death. But yeah, their answer. <laughs> but um, Dr. Jones here, this is why I think theodicy in general, better than what's the apologist answer to that objection. That's why a, a robust theodicy is more important than just learning answers or responses to that's right arguments because that's it's right. it's more rich and it, you know mm -hmm. it, and it also i think in, in increases the weight of the answers in your you know to these objections but a lot of people don't want to get into that and i think they they cut the you know, they cut the power source off from our response to the problem of evil when they just give a philosophical response to an, a philosophical objection. I okay, think that's, here, I agree oh, with I'm you, sorry, Jonathan. Ahead, Let me make one more comment because yeah, if yeah. I don't say this before we leave, uh, b before this ends, I'm going to regret it. And that is, you've got to realize something when it comes to this fallen world that I live in and that we all live in. If Christianity is true, we're going to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We're going to have eternal life and eternity will dwarf our suffering here to insignificance. Uh, that's what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians where he says, this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And when he says beyond all comparison, he's not being hyperbolic. He's saying it literally, you can't compare even a hundred years here of suffering to eternal glory. You can't, what, I mean, it's like, it's, it's less much, much, it's infinitely, you know, what seals, uh, what Navy seals goes through for to, so that one day they can say, I'm a seal. I mean, I see this life that we're in here as boot camp for eternity. And, uh, when I say it's boot camp for eternity, uh, and our boot camp is actually harder than Navy SEAL training. Why do I say that? Because 100% of the time, our boot camp ends in our deaths. <laughs> so yeah. so it's rough, but we're going <laughs> to live forever, never, 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 never. I just okay. can't emphasize that enough. How about three more? Can you do three more questions, Clay? Sure. All right. All right. So I want to get through these super chats mm -hmm. at least. And um, uh, so... Uh, Christian idealism says, wouldn't an appeal to the fall lower prior probability of theism? So problem of evil ends up favoring naturalism. And then they clarify by adding the fall as an auxiliary, auxiliary hypothesis. Um, do you understand what's being communicated there? Not very well, but you know, the, again, I'm, I don't know what they mean exactly by Christian idealism and it's whatnot. I'm de I'm not defending Christian idealism. I'm defending the God no, of the no, no. Bible. No, no, no. Christian idealism is the name of the channel there. That's a channel that is called oh. Christian idealism. Oh, sorry. And they're I commenting here, and I'll read it okay. again just so everyone hears. Wouldn't an appeal to the fall lower the prior probability of theism so that the problem of evil ends up favoring naturalism by adding the fall as an auxiliary hypothesis, that is? So I think they're saying we would maybe, – maybe he's saying you, you might expect um, – evil on naturalism and then you uh, i think the fact that the fall has to be added to yeah, get you there the God is the problem it's simplicity yeah it's like it's like okay so you have if you if you're going to grant god it seems like that would default more to a less gratuitous evil cosmos and then you have to add the fall in it's like you're or, having to add the fall or it seems it. like that, that lowers the probability because it seems more likely more probable that without naturalism just kind of explains why it's a mess yeah, I think the problem is yeah. you're having to add something, namely the fall, right. to get this theodicy. What are your well, thoughts that is, on that? that is, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and I'm just going with what it says. Uh, <laughs> when people say, yeah, but I don't, and they start to challenge various aspects of the story. And they say, well, I don't believe that story. I say, well, I don't care. Uh, because it's you're asking me why I why the god that why i think that the god that i serve is totally justified in allowing evil and this is what the bible says if you say well i don't agree with this or that part of the bible or i don't think that that should have been there or whatever i go well so what i mean you're asking me why the god that i worship allows evil and i appeal to the bible if you want to say the bible's false okay we can do that but that's a separate argument 
Yeah. Uh, we're going to get we're going to get off into why we, should we believe the Bible is the word of God? Why should we believe that it's accurately reported? Those are legitimate apologetic issues. But and I and as I say, if people do that to me, I say we can get off into those. It's the, but that's a different issue than you're asking me why I believe that the God yeah. that, that I worship allows evil. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Well, I'm going to ask good. about the prior <laughs> probability, you know, probability of naturalism itself to even be a better explanatory power for evil, because I'm like, where do you get a cosmos with, without? Well, uh, you know? yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, you're, yeah, so no. you're saying it doesn't explain <laughs> yeah. it because you wouldn't have a universe on that explanation. <laughs> right. So, no, so it let's back up that step. Out, I, I can grant that if you assume on naturalism. Yeah. It's it, a, it, sorry, Dr. It, Jones. It, it may John Pritchett got yeah, excited. It may, lower, it may lower it if we assume all things being equal, but... Yeah. From whence does the cosmos come, and yeah. why should we? Why? Because to me, uh, you would be really annoying. I bet as a student in a philosophy class, probably. But it just seems to me it's more likely to have a cosmos, whether it has evil or not, if it was created by yeah. a god, as opposed to just well, something happened. It's a different. So it, it doesn't really add a new methodology. So, so I could just say I could say maybe it does, but it, that doesn't seem to amount to much because you got to have a cosmos there. Then we yeah. can haggle over what's the best explanation for why there's something at all yeah well anyway. okay we get okay here we go logical plausible probable Woo, love says that name. thanks so much for the phenomenal conversation i greatly appreciate your logical answers and blunt rejection of the standard youtube atheist talking points oh well, there you well, go yeah that is that that covers what happened Thank pretty you. well all right last question of the day coming from digital oh wait no hold on i can't because there was a super chat from Kevin O'Connor that I can't find, but he also asked this question. Yeah. So I'm sorry I didn't get your super chat question, Kevin. I'm going to read this one. It says, uh, I know that this stream is about atheism's best argument, but while we're on the topic, doesn't the eternal nature of heaven mean that all possibilities will eventually happen? So, you know, it's so like we'll all be bored in heaven eventually because all possibilities will be exhausted. Including the possibility you that... Know, you know, that's uh, actually a huge question among atheists. Uh, in fact, I've got a, a, a section in my book, Why Does God Allow Evil on Will Heaven Be Boring? And atheists actually argue it will be necessarily boring. Uh, it, it, it that it because we're going to because of exactly that, that it's going to be necessarily boring. And what they'll say is they'll say, we, we in our life here, we experience that our love's after a while we're out we get tired of things we're no longer interested in this and that and and in heaven we're just not going to like that anymore uh, there's a lot of different answers to that uh, one however is um and, and and it's interesting too because what they'll do is they'll do a straw man and there's a guy that's on richard dawkins channel all the time brit british fellow big and i can't remember his name offhand but he says could you imagine eating the same piece of chocolate or the same chocolate cake forever and ever and ever and ever or reading the same book forever and ever and ever and ever wouldn't that be tedious what a ridiculously stupid straw man that is uh nobody i would never eat chocolate cake now forever i mean but yeah if you gave me a piece of chocolate cake once in a while yeah uh you know i like crab legs but if i ate them every day i don't see the reason why i'm going to get tired of things uh, first of all, I, I don't think that logically follows. And in my book, I quote a lot of philosophers that say, I don't think that logically follows that I'm necessarily uh, going to get tired of it. One guy said, you know, I've attended the first game of, you know, for my team, my baseball team, I've attended this first, uh, the first game every year. He says, I look forward to that. He says, I don't see why in a thousand years from now, I wouldn't want to keep doing that if I was still alive. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it, it's supportably true, but now here's the second thing, but atheists say, yeah, but we get tired of things and, and the world's not that satisfying. What the atheist is often doing is they're saying, if we lived on forever on planet earth, wouldn't that get tedious? Well, it might, if we lived on forever on just this same planet, it's kind of icky, uh, but atheists go, I'm not satisfied. Well, no, but that's because atheists have a problem within themselves. And the problem in themselves is you, this world was not meant to give you satisfaction. Jesus says, you know, I mean, I will give you the water while you're, while you're where you will never thirst again. The atheist will forever until they come to Jesus will forever be re repeating the refrain of the Rolling Stones refrain, I can't get no satisfaction. Hmm. You weren't supposed to. This world wasn't supposed to satisfy you. But um, 
Anyway, I, I go on well, in my All right, la question. last question. My here. answer to that last is question. is no, because it's going to... Uh, it's like numbers it, because I believe that time will continue to be successive. You'll never exhaust and reach an actual. It'll always be approaching, but never arriving at, at infinity. Actual, at actual infinity. Yeah. Exha ex exhausting uh, all possibilities. Okay. So La it can't do it can't do that because you can always think of one more thing to do. Mm -hmm. All right. I can. Digital Gnosis says, question for Clay. The competition between genes and our biology causes cancer. What about our free will causes us to have to be that way and get cancer? It's not our free, well, sometimes it's our free will. If you smoke and you get lung cancer, that's uh, your free will. Uh, the other thing is um, it's Adam and Eve's free will uh, that resulted in God cursing the ground. That's the result of free will. And so that that can get off to, into, if you want, a conversation about you know Adam and Eve and why we suffer more for their sin. We are them, frankly, by the way, we are Adams and Eves. Um, and, uh, uh, it, that was one of the most amazing things to me is to realize that the Hebrew word for man in the old Testament is Adam. Yeah. So, cause I used to sit there and go, Adam isn't mentioned very much in the old, yeah. in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized the word for in the old Testament for man is Adam. So they're always yeah. reading son of son of Adam, you know, instead of son of man, I mean, they're reading it son of Adam, but anyway. I, I, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think that the, the bottom line is, is that we are Adam and Eve's and, and we are uh, suffering. And I'm not sure I might have gotten distracted from and, no, and so because th they sin we're we are them and we are pain. We are. Yes, we are. In a sense, uh, we are being hurt by the sin of Adam and Eve. Free creatures hurt each other all the time. Uh, yeah. That's within and our natural experience. And affect the natural environment through our choices that we make. Whether <laughs> when I talk about cancers, whether it's what people freely choose to put in uh, processed foods that they probably shouldn't, whatever else. But again, if you accept yeah. the premise of global warming is even possible, then you believe that humans' free will actions affect more than just moral behavior between humans, but, but affect this is, this, the, this, environment the, the environment around them. And our bodies are part of the environment uh, that has been affected but by this, free will. But choices. this is a this is a good thing to get into just here at the end because it allows us to make the comment that when we say that free will is involved in the answer uh in answering the problem of evil um that doesn't mean that what we're saying is that on this theodicy any particular evil thing that happens to you is because of something you did now that is a common thing okay. that we're all tempted to right. think as believers from time to time that the enemy has the same bag of tricks he uses on all of us but the fact is um, uh, that's, that's an important distinction because yeah. people will drive themselves crazy thinking God's never pleased right. with it, them it not, because well, they have a bad back. If you get, yeah. If you get a cold, it's not because you made a free, it is, you can't tie that back to any specific. Now it might decision. be, but I don't think we have a way to know. It's like, uh, my clay, this is one of my favorites. Or my wife came up with this or, or, or cancer or whatever. You, if you say like a non-smoker or whatever, yeah. you don't know what free will choice or whatever. But the point is. Free will choices have created yeah, that's the, the environment that, that's the where these but, things happen. But, but I have to use the grandma. Yeah. I, my wife came up with this, and I call it the grandma fallacy. She's talking about her. she was in her garage jumping rope one day, and her grandma came out there and said, you better come inside and eat dinner. And she kept jumping rope. And this happened two or three more times, and she fell and busted her nose. And her grandma Ooh. said, see there, that's God punishing you for not listening to your grandmama. <laughs> well, Maybe. Maybe, but I don't think grandmama was in a position to know that, nor do I think that whatever preacher who comes out on TV when a, when an earthquake happens and says that's God judging America for whatever, I don't think he knows either, but he might be right. You know, it's, it's like, so I just don't want people to plague themselves with that. Like, you know? what did I do? Yeah. What, what action did I take that caused me to do this? Right, right. Yeah, I agree, of course. I, 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 I hate it when preachers say this earthquake occurred because of this or this sin or that. That's it. Cities. That being said, I think that if if you feel like something's gone wrong in your life, you might it's because it's Hebrews twelve endure hardship as discipline for God is treating you as sons. Uh, sometimes I'll stop and say, Lord, why did this happen? Is it? And I'll reflect and go, Hmm. Uh, I you know I mean sometimes well James. Uh, if anybody is sick, let him come to the elders of the church and pray for him. And if he's committed any sins, they'll be forgiven is that sometimes people are sick because they've sinned. Uh, you know, Jesus, when he says, when they said to him, does this man sin or his parents? He said, neither is for the glory of God. Jesus didn't say that's stupid. Nobody ever, nobody's ever sick because of sin. That's not true. Uh, he, uh, First Corinthians 11, many uh, about 
communion. He says, many of you are sick and some have died uh, because you take of the cup in an unworthy manner. So I do That's think right. there's room for us to do a little, I, for me to say, point to somebody else and say, you, you suffered because of, I, I can't do that. But sometimes yeah. in praying and seeking the Lord, I'll go, hmm, I think the Lord's trying to rebuke me here <laughs> and I want to pay attention. Yeah. Well, thank you for that super chat that we just threw up there. Whoever that was with the Thundercats logo. I really appreciate that. That means so much and it was, uh, it's helpful. So, all right. Um, this has been a blast. Clay Jones, I feel like I made a friend. I, I knew you before from the conference, but I, I feel like I've gotten to know you a little better here. Um, anything you want to say in terms of um, where people can get your stuff? Obviously, Amazon or something. Then go get your book. Amazon. You know, my book. I have that book over, uh, you know, Immortal and uh how the fear of death drives us and what we can do about it i think that would help a lot of people uh but where, yeah amazon you can get them from amazon where, where's your blog site because you you have a oh, lot of interesting clayjones.net okay. what yeah clayjones.net what could be simpler that's right Clay Jones, go go check it out you will find everything on it he is not uh, he, Trust me, there are some things that I was like, he's writing about that subject? Wow. See, you thought it's, we were having you on, yeah. Clay, to talk about the problem of evil. In reality, we were trying to get the origin story for Jonathan Pritchett and why he go. is the creature that he is. And I can see a That's lot right. of you coming through in Pritchett. But one of the things I love, Clay, is a lot of times professors can be the stuffy, you know, boring. You sound like you had been a pastor at some point, point in your life. I was. You know, I was yeah. a pastor, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know how to talk to people. And I actually like a lot of pa a lot of professors are introverts. That's really interesting to me because I you I, it doesn't seem to add up to me, but many of them are. I'm not. I actually like being with people. <laughs> yeah, so. well, good. Well, you can be with us anytime, Dr. Clay Jones. Thank you so much for being with us today. And folks, it's been a blast. Um, now, there's not going to be an after show today. That's cool. That'll be on Friday after Friday's show. And I'm thinking Friday we're going to talk about Skillet and uh, what that guy said. That no, to me, just sounds Lord, like the yeah. lyrics of I'm in the Lord's Army. But we're going to talk about it and see if he offended everyone or whatever. So, all right, Dr. Jones, thank you so thank much you for being so with much. us today. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me. It's been a pleasure to be with you and good to see you again, Jonathan. And good to be, yes. get to know you both a little better. It's wonderful. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. All right. We'll have you back on to talk about heaven or something. We'll see you later. Okay.